Chapter Two of Our Little Australian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet. Chapter Two Sailing to Sydney. The travellers set sail for Sydney in a calm and beautiful afternoon when earth and sea seemed at peace. The sea sparkled in the sunlight, as if set in diamonds, and the vessel fairly danced over the waters as it sailed out of Bass Strait into the dark waters of the blue Pacific. The afternoon passed quietly, and toward evening all gathered on deck to see the sunset, for Australia is noted as the land of wonderful sunsets, and from the sea these can be viewed in all their splendour. Gold, crimson, yellow, pink, from brilliant to soft, from light to dark, the clouds changed in countless colour schemes, bewilderingly beautiful. The whole sky was a dome of softest rose, then a flaming crimson, then pearly tinted heliotrope. The sea, too, shone in varying shades of beauty, until all melted and blended into one exquisitely soft shade of deep-toned purple, and into this the smiling stars stole one by one, the countless stars of the southern night, and above all shone the glory of the southern cross. "'Oh, father,' whispered Jean, "'I have never seen anything so beautiful. Is the sunset always like this in Australia?' "'This was a particularly fine one, daughter, but whenever the sun sets it is a thing worth looking at.' "'How quickly it has grown dark after all that splendour,' said Mrs. Hume, looking at the sky over which the clouds were passing." "'I don't like the look of the sky,' said Mr. Hume. "'I'm afraid there's a squall coming.' "'Worse than a squall, sir,' said a sailor, hurrying by. "'It looks to me like a hurricane.' The air had grown suddenly warm, and the sky was overhung with heavy clouds, while flashes of lightning blazed across the sky. Suddenly a great waterspout seemed to rise up like an inky black pillar from sea to sky. The ship tossed about and pitched so badly that it was impossible to keep one's feet, and Mr. Hume led his little party to the cabin. "'Oh, father, what shall we do?' cried Jean, frightened. "'Go to sleep is the best thing to do if you can,' he said. And the children were put to bed in their berths, in which they could hardly stay, so violent was the pitching of the ship. The wind howled and roared, and, as the storm kept up all night, there was little sleep in the cabin. When the morning came it was little better. Sea and sky were dull grey, save where the foam-crested waves broke in sheets of spray against the sides of the vessel, sending the foam high into the air. "'It is a cross sea,' said the sailor on the lookout, and the captain shook his head. "'It's a bad outlook,' he said. "'I don't like the grey water.' "'I thought Pacific meant peaceful,' said Fergus, who stood clinging to his father on deck, looking at the wonderful scene. "'It doesn't seem peaceful to me,' as a great wave broke over the deck and drenched him to the skin. "'Like most peaceful things, it is terrible when it is roused,' said Mr. Hume. "'There is a strong current running up and down this eastern shore of Australia, and it often sets vessels quite out of their course.' Sometimes they are washed miles out of their way, and occasionally, in the darkness, run upon one of the little islands which dot this sea. "'Is Tasmania one of them?' asked Fergus. "'We have long since passed Tasmania,' said his father, "'but there are many little islands between here and Sydney. "'There! What is that?' he exclaimed. Suddenly it seemed as if land sprang at them through the fog, and they were almost upon a rocky shore.' So near to it was their steamer that there was barely time to put about, and it was only by the quickest action that they escaped the rocks. The steamer lurched and rolled, pitched and tossed in the gale, but she passed the rocks in safety, and as afternoon waned and night drew on, the storm grew less, until by midnight the sea was quiet. The morning of the third day broke in a golden splendour. The air was fresh and cool, the sky and the sea were as blue as a sapphire, the children glad to be out of the stuffy cabin and up on deck. 
"'If the weather continues like this, we shall not be long in reaching Sydney,' said Mr. Hume. "'And I am sure we shall all be glad to get there.' "'What kind of a place is Sydney?' asked Fergus. "'It is a fine city, my boy, and very different from what it was when Botany Bay was peopled with felons.' "'What are felons?' asked Jean. "'Felons are people who have done wrong, and must be kept in prison for punishment, in the hope that they will learn to do right,' answered Mr. Hume. "'Botany Bay was named by the botanist Joseph Banks, who was with Cook when he made his first voyage in 1770. "'It is an inlet near Sydney, and the English sent their criminals there until 1840. "'Such men as behaved well when they reached the colony were allowed to leave the penal settlement upon tickets, and were called ticket-of-leave men.' They could be followed up and brought back if they misbehaved in any way. Many of them were good men who had been led into wrongdoing, and were glad to have a chance to be good again. They went out into the bush, cleared farms or sheep stations, and many of them grew rich. Quite a number of the good citizens of Australia today could, if they would, trace their descent back to ticket-of-leave men." "'I shouldn't think they would like to do that,' said Fergus. "'I wouldn't like anyone to know that my people had done wrong.' "'Everybody does wrong,' said Jean sagely. "'Yes, but everyone isn't found out,' her brother answered. "'When they are, it hurts.' "'But if it's found out that they're sorry, "'and are going to do good for ever and ever,' "'the little girl looked puzzled, "'then does it matter?' "'Dear little childish point of view,' said her mother with a smile, and her father added, "'It would be a good thing if older people felt so.'" Sydney looked beautiful enough as their ship steamed into the bay to pay them for their troublesome voyage. The harbour is one of the handsomest in the world. The city is picturesquely situated upon the bold and rocky slopes which rise from the water's edge, and is defended from any possible attack by bristling forts and batteries. "'This narrow entrance to the harbour is called the Heads,' said Mr. Hume to the children, who were dancing about asking a thousand questions, of which their father answered the most important. The lighthouse is a guide to all storm-driven sailors, and also a good lookout, should any enemies of England hope to steal upon Australia unawares. I think Sydney one of the most delightfully situated cities I have ever visited. It is surrounded by parks and groves where grow bananas, orange trees, palms, and all manner of tropical plants. Its climate is healthful, and life here easy and pleasant." "'The buildings seem very handsome,' said Mrs. Hume, as the city came into view, gleaming white and beautiful in the morning sun. "'The sandstone upon which the town is built gives fine building material,' said her husband. "'And while in the older part of the city streets are narrow and houses old-fashioned, the newer portion compares favourably with almost any of the modern European cities. "'We are just about in now. The sailors are making ready to cast the hawser.' "'Oh, Fergus, there is Mildred!' cried Mrs. Hume to her husband, pointing to a sweet-faced little woman who stood beside a large, burly-looking man upon the wharf. "'It is worth almost the long journey from home just to see her again,' and she stretched out her hands to the sister whom she had not seen for ten years. Soon they were landed, and the two sisters greeted each other joyfully. "'Elsie, how glad I am to welcome you to Australia!' cried Mrs. MacDonald, while her sister said, "'Mildred, you don't look a day older than when you left Scotland.' "'Life is easy out here,' said Mr. MacDonald genially. "'Come, all of you, the carriage is waiting. We are glad to have a visit from you, and want it to be as long a visit as possible. We have planned all manner of things to do during your stay.' As they drove through the handsome streets, Mrs. MacDonald said, "'It is nearly time we went into the country, and after you are well rested and have seen Sydney, Angus is going to take us up to the station, so you can see just what life is on an Australian run.'" Footnote. Run is the name given to a ranch in Australia. End footnote. "'I am sure we shall enjoy it,' said Mrs. Hume. 
but just now I can think of nothing to do but getting rested. The sea motion is still in my head, and I believe that if I could go to bed and think that Jean could sleep without danger of falling out of bed, I could sleep for two or three days without waking up. "'We'll take care of the wee lassie, and of this big boy, too,' said Mr. MacDonald kindly, laying an arm about Fergus's shoulder. "'Sandy is up at the run, and you will have fine times with him there, and your mother shall rest as long as she wants to. "'But you are not seeing the sights as we pass. We think Sydney about the finest thing on this side of the world. These buildings are a part of the university. The College of St. Paul's there belongs to the Church of England, and St. John's is Roman Catholic.' "'It is all very handsome,' said Mrs. Hume. "'How Sydney has changed since I was here,' said Mr. Hume. "'It is not like the same place.' "'Its growth is simply wonderful,' said Mr. MacDonald. "'We have now all manner of manufactories. "'Wagons are made here and sold all over Australia and New Zealand. "'There are fine glass and pottery works, boot and shoe factories, "'besides stove foundries and carriage works.' Tobacco and fine liquors are manufactured here, and Sydney is really the centre of the British colonies in the south. "'Here we are at home,' said his wife, "'so your interesting lecture must cease. I am sure Elsie would rather see a good cup of tea and a comfortable bed than hear your discourse on the beauties of Sydney, when she is homesick for dear little Glasgow.' "'Tea and bed will do much to do away with homesickness, and the sight of you will do more,' said her sister, as they alighted from the carriage, and went up the steps of a handsome house, surrounded by fine trees, and a garden radiant with flowers. End of chapter 2 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on Saturday, July 6th, 2013, in San Diego, California.